Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to welcome Joanna Penn to this podcast. She's the author of Audio for Authors, audiobooks, podcasting, and voice technologies. And I wanted to interview her because I've gotten a, a great interest on my own for these topics. And she's also the author of How to Write Nonfiction, How to Make a Living with Your Writing, Successful Self-Publishing, and Public Speaking for Authors, Creatives, and Introverts, which again, you know, I may have to have her on again sometime to talk about that because there are a lot of authors who are introverts. So anyway, and today we want to focus on how to use audio both to market your books as well as to create additional product or services that you might um, you know, want to offer the people that read your books. So welcome, Joanna. Oh, thanks for having me, John. And I <laughs> first listened to you like years and years ago, like 15 years ago, I listened to your audios. Back then we didn't have podcasts, we just had downloadable audio, right? So right. that's how I uh, I first heard of you. I used to listen on the way to work. And so, yeah, what goes around comes around. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I used to do a, a lot of Audible webinars and the, that was the, the best way to do it at the time. Uh, even though I'm sure back then I was trying to do video as well, but um, video is even harder. Now both are easier. Oh, for um, sure. Mm. So why why would an author want to focus? I'm going to throw you a left wing uh, uh, <laughs> sidebar or something like that. Uh, why would an author even want to get involved in audio at all? Well, I think one of the main reasons is because it's a whole separate market. So when I think about my household as me and my husband, um, I yes. don't I haven't read blogs for years. I listen to podcasts and I listen to audiobooks and I read books. I don't even watch videos. I, I don't I'm not a video person. My husband watches YouTube and he listens to podcasts and he re reads and listens to books. So in our even just in our household and we're in the UK, we get our information from podcasting and we also get our entertainment from podcasting so if you're so so if you want to reach us um then <laughs> uh, then you know and, and we're just why uh, would i want to meet, <laughs> meet you guys <laughs> well we're just a small proportion of of the world right so what we well, found I mean, what we found with audio is that um, year on year, audiobook sales have been like double digit growth for the last eight years now. It is um, one of these, and podcasting is one of the ways to reach people while they're doing other things. So it, right. it has kind of like when you're reading a blog post, you still have to look at it. Whereas with podcasting, you can be in someone's ear. It's a personal form of marketing. It can be free. Like there are so many reasons why you would consider audiobooks and also podcasting and audio in general. It, it's it's a way to reach people. It's a way to express yourself. And I found it a very effective way to sell books and make money through other income streams. Well, I was happy to see that you had an audio of your audio for authors book. Of course, self-narrated <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. But I, I suspect that most people would actually rather read your book because they're going to want to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this this is an interesting point, John. And another thing that's very important, people who listen to audiobooks buy other formats. So for example, Atomic Habits by James Clear, I'm listening to at the right. moment on audiobook. I also own in hardback and on Kindle because exactly what you're saying, I like to listen to it when I'm walking. I like to highlight it on my Kindle and I like to underline things in hardback books and keep it on my shelf. So this is what I found with my nonfiction in particular, people will buy multiple multiple formats so if you sell more okay. audio you actually sell more print which is crazy yeah i get that uh my wife uh she has glaucoma and uh so she can't uh read much mm. so she loves listening to audiobooks and she's i mean she listens probably three or four hours a day uh to audio while she's doing things in the kitchen and stuff like that so that uh you know she really consumes the content uh her favorite series was the outlander series oh yes by Wonderful. diana gabaldon and i brought home the the first uh set the outlander uh novel the original uh in audio from the library and 
suddenly I was because the library didn't have the whole series. I had to spend some money. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's actually another tip for people. I mean, you know this, obviously, in terms of marketing, having a series is a really good idea. And the same principle applies for um, audiobooks. If you have more than one, uh, especially done with the same narrator, then right. that makes a huge difference. Because if people like the voice of the narrator, they'll look for other things. If they like the voice, in inverted commas, of the author, they'll look for other things. So it is definitely uh, a series is very powerful. Well, the unfortunate thing is that then she wanted to buy books as gifts to introduce her to her sister and her, her best friend and a number of other people. So it, it became a costly little freebie that I got from the library. But, you know, that's what happens. Part of it is, you know, uh, what criteria should authors use to decide whether or not to publish their book as an audio? I mean, should they do all books or is there some things that like my thousand and one ways to market your books, you know, yeah. 700 pages. I would say I've that's a no, no. It's a no, no, John. <laughs> There's a couple of reasons why I wouldn't do your book there. One, it's very long. It'd be very expensive um, to do, but also you update it fairly regularly and right. that is another reason so if you're going to update a book like facebook marketing 101 is something that i wouldn't do in audio because facebook changes their setup like every five uh, minutes so and it's, every time you put out a book you're like oh i need to do another edition so i well, do i i think of you know, I wouldn't even want to write that book. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. But when you think about uh, is this or, or something on law or politics, although then, you know, often people want to listen because it's so boring. <laughs> but in terms of whether it's worth doing, look, there's different criteria for fiction and nonfiction. So that, but let's talk about length, because your book is a good example of nonfiction. But let's face it, most but most nonfiction books are not the length of your book. So right. non, uh, a nonfiction book, say around 40 to 50,000 words, which is what my audio for authors is I think it's about 55,000 right. words absolutely brilliant in audio because people want people who want that book want that book so they'll pay a premium for that book but something like a hundred thousand or hundred and fifty thousand word fantasy novel if you're going to pay for production yourself that's very very expensive and the money you get in return is probably just a credit on or a subscription program um, so it's expensive to produce and you might not make your money back that fast so right. what I would do, what, what I would do in these situations is try and license your audio. So uh, obviously the different ways to do things, but you could license it to a company and then they will take the production costs and also a percentage of the income. You can do it, uh, manage it yourself. We can talk about the companies in a minute uh, with a professional, or you can narrate it yourself and distribute. So I, um, I do lots of different things, but in terms of, Nonfiction, fiction and length, those are some kind of scales. Then I would also say, are you already selling a lot of books? Because a brand new author with a brand new self-published book and no budget, I would say, don't do it. It's not worth spending the money on that. Better to spend that money on other forms of marketing, for example, discounting and, and ads and, and that kind of thing. So right. that would be um, another thing. And also, do you have a way to market them? So again, we know this. I mean, whatever format your book is in, people are like, well, why aren't I selling? any well it's actually it's probably harder to sell audiobooks if you don't have a marketing plan in general for all your other formats and also if you haven't got some specific marketing ideas for um, audio in particular so those are some things um, I will say from my personal perspective I have fiction and non-fiction I make far more money from non-fiction audio both selling direct and also on the various platforms and that's because that um, people want to spend more money on non-fiction they'll buy direct from me and I have a podcast where I can market really easily whereas my fiction is less easy to market and it's less profitable yeah uh I can see that and it's one reason I didn't do the thousand and one mm. ways yet but I have thought about breaking it up into some That's of the, the chapters yeah. there's 80 mm. or 100 page chapters mm. in the book and I thought well I should probably do those as audio Yes, um, that's exactly what I would have advised someone. It's just the thing is the way Amazon, the Amazon page works. Now, you don't obviously there are lots of other sites other than Amazon. Um, but the way that Amazon works is that obviously it links the audiobook to the actual um, book. 
So if, if you do chapters, they're going to appear separately, which is also fine. And people will find them differently on different markets. So I, I think this is good to consider. You can do audio only products. You have to do them through findawayvoices.com because if you go through acx.com, they require you to link it to um, an ASIN, an Amazon number. Okay. But I could uh, theoretically break up the chapters into smaller, uh, you know, break smaller up the e book into smaller yeah. books and then uh, link that to the audio. Yeah, absolutely. But then you'd almost be starting again with your project, which, you know, your, your 1001 ways, that's what it's been for how many years, like 20 <laughs> years or time. something. So now it would be 100 ideas. 10 times 100 ideas plus an extra one. It's not quite so catchy. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it gets a little complicated, but I think I could do it if I ever get around to it. The, the thing that I find is, you know, how easy is it to create an audio for uh, a book, uh, say from a beginning, you know, from a beginning author who doesn't know anything about it at all? Right. Well, if you uh, you don't need to know anything. I mean, if you want, if you, <laughs> if you definitely want to do an audio book, but you want someone else to narrate it and distribute it, you just go on to findawayvoices.com, um, which I prefer, which is the wide um, way of publishing. And it means your audio books will be in libraries and in all the they're also owned by um, Spotify now. So that right. has a lot of potential for 2022. But essentially, you log on, you create an account um, and then then you find a narrator, uh, you upload your book and you pay and you get an audio book and then it's distributed automatically and they send you money at the end of the month. So <laughs> it, it's really- Oh, I like that part. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you do, or, but this is the money. Remember, you have to pay up front for the audio and then you get money back as it sells like any other book. So that's the sort of self-publishing way. Another way is obviously to license where you get money up front, someone else has it. Um, the, the next way, of course, is that you can narrate it yourself and then you have made those files as the narrator and then you edit them and upload them on the same platform on Findaway. So it's cheaper by once you're good at it, <laughs> but there is a bit of a learning curve. So I decided right. um, about a decade ago now that I wanted to narrate my own audiobooks from for non-fiction only because I have a voice brand, because I have a podcast. And uh, I also wanted to, uh, at the time, I didn't have much money. So I thought, well, I'll just do it myself as I always do. I'm very independent. And uh, since then, I've, I've got much better at it. Um, I have some sound blankets here in the corner and I record here. I can edit my own and master my own audiobook. So my process now is very slick. And so essentially I invested some time in learning how to do this and learned some audio. So you, if you want to do it yourself and you have a number of books, then it's definitely something you can do. But maybe we'll come on later to the AI stuff um, that I'm interested in in the future, right. voice licensing for AI and that kind of thing. So things are, things are changing, the costs are changing. But um, in terms of is it easy, it's kind of like you have to pick what you want to spend your time on. So the, the easiest way is obviously um, to just hire a narrator and pay them to do it. And then the product is done. But so it depends. let's say that uh, you have a 200 page book and then you hire uh, findaway voice, uh, findaway.com? Findawayvoices.com. It is findaway voices. Okay. Uh, would it, about how much would it cost to do something like that, say for a 200 page book? Okay, so you can't think in pages when it comes to uh, digital. Well, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what you have to do is think in words, in word count. So, yeah. um, uh, see, I don't even, I don't even think in, um, I don't even know how many words that is. So let's just go with, I'll tell you what they price in. They price in per finished hour, and a okay. finished hour is about 9,000 words. Okay. So that kind and the price per finished hour might be somewhere between 200 and 450 US dollars per so, finished hour. So that would add up. Uh, exactly. So you've got that 100,000 100, word fantasy novel. That's going to cost you like 10 grand. 
and yeah. how long will it take you to get that money back? Whereas for me, uh, for example, successful self-publishing, which is um, it's free as an ebook, and then I narrated the audio book. It's only about an hour and a half. <laughs> And I did it myself and uploaded it and I just get money for that. And so that that's all the different matrices of is it worth learning? How many books do you have? That's another thing. Like right. for me, I've got like 14 yeah. nonfiction books, so it's worth it. And you me. have a lot of fiction, too. Yes, but fiction, see, fiction requires different, not different accents, but different, at least distinguishing between characters and all of that. So fiction is a very different beast. Um, I pay professionals for my fiction, except my <laughs> short stories. I do my own short stories. Okay. Um, which I quite like. Um, yeah, I'm not intending to do fiction. That's definitely a thing. <laughs> I could see doing that for audio, uh, for a poetry book. Yeah, poetry is uh, a good a, one. Hmm. I have a small poetry book that it would be kind of fun to narrate it and uh, put it out there. Yeah. I've done I've done some individual poems and then read them because uh, I have one podcast that I do called "Tell Me a Story" uh, podcast and where I tell stories because my wife has written a lot of sh uh, short stories and then I did. Um, I did some of my poems that way as well in that podcast. Mm. And I, what, and what I, I did a say. couple of short stories just recently there as well. Mm. It's sporadic. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm breaking one of the prime rules of podcasts, which is, you know, do it on a regular yeah. basis. <laughs> it has to be, it has to be um, a habit. But in terms of uh, the uh, audio quality between podcasting and audiobook narration that there, there are rules and levels you have to apply so once you understand it then it's not that big a deal but there is a difference in quality in terms of sound so um yeah you but I mean that's too technical to go into right now obviously there's stuff in the book and things but um it, <laughs> there is there is a a floor and a ceiling for where your sound needs to be, which is different to podcasting. Uh, that I think that's important to note. You can't just take your podcast and upload it onto Find A Way. Um, so your short story that you've narrated, you would have to do it again within an environment that that gave it the right sound. I get it. Uh, with a British accent, of course. <laughs> no, your accent is fine. Because <laughs> the nice thing is there that it's your story or your poem. And, and, and this is the thing about audio. It connects us to connects us very personally to the narrator, which is why the narrator is so important. And if you get the narrator wrong, like um, my husband with his fantasy, like he only listens to fantasy books and he's like, this narrator was so wrong. I'm not listening to any more of that series. It's terrible. <laughs> I'm just, that person pronounced things wrong. I mean, I was like, whoa, chill out. But people really care about their narrators. Well, I've noticed that with narrators. Uh, there are some women that read books and she, they make the uh, men all sound slow and dumb, <laughs> you, you know. I just won't uh, but, comment but, on that, John. <laughs> uh, men, men do it the other way. They make women sound light and flighty, and oh my yeah. gosh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Help and, me. <laughs> but you know, there are some that are incredible. Like for the Outlander series, the narrator there, she is incredible. Yes, she's probably a professional actress. And uh, but this is. is this is where uh, okay, just from an audio perspective, there are also different kinds of listeners. There are different kinds of readers, just like there are in fiction. Like some fiction readers will only read literary fiction that's won an award. Um, some people <laughs> want a romance a day. Some people like me, I want thrillers, I want escape. Um, you know, so you have to think some listeners, like for, I, for me, I will listen to a really professional audio with amazing actresses or a full cast drama. Like I will listen to that, but mostly I listen to about 80% non-fiction books on 1.5 speed so I listen at a faster <laughs> speed so the whole like performance of the artist and they're breathing everything it doesn't matter because I'm listening at 1.5 speed you can even get rid of the pauses so you can just because the brain can take things in much faster than people speak um right. so this I think this is interesting don't assume that your listener is not out there if you see what I mean like like people want audio so give it a go. I don't want to put people off. Like you don't need to be a professional actor or actress to do, to narrate an audiobook. I'm not. 
Yes, and, and you can certainly start that way. And then mm. if you find out that it sells well, then you can always upgrade your audio. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the questions I had was how does an author price an audio book, you know, versus, uh, uh, you know, a paperback, hardcover, or a Kindle ebook? Hmm. Well, uh, the main thing is uh, Audible, you don't get to set your price. They set your price. So <laughs> <laughs> it's really cheeky, but essentially they set their price. They do the discounting, which is why it's so brilliant that they are not the only game in town. So that's why I recommend findawayvoices.com because they distribute to 43 different retailers, including things like libraries, where actually you get paid per checkout, which is a micropayment per checkout. Um, right. or, or Scribd, for example, you get a micropayment per borrow. Um, uh, there, there are different models, credit model, the purchase model. But when if you purchase, if you distribute through Findaway, you do get to set a price um, for sale and for a library and for a promotion. Right. So um, and this is where you need to look at your genre and price basically according to genre and according to length but again the problem with length is a hundred and fifty thousand word fantasy novel you still can't price very high whereas a fifty thousand word non-fiction book you can price higher because non-fiction listeners pay more so i sell my audio direct as well through payhip.com and i normally price it um probably around the same as the paperback so i think that um audio for authors is about 12.99 um us or 14.99 us for the audiobook um and like half that for the ebook i think um right. approximately it, that it seemed like it was about equivalent in that mm. particular one uh to your paperback i think it's one dollar less than your paperback Mm. And then with Findaway, you can on do Amazon. price promotions. Yeah, on Amazon. Yeah, and that's Audible, so they just do what the hell they like. <laughs> <laughs> and you just get whatever's left. <laughs> but yes, you do also, you can do promotional pricing if you um, publish through Findaway. So Chirp, Chirp Books uh, is really, really good for audio deals. And that is a way to really sell a lot of audio. And a Chirp book is... Chirp Books is a website. Do you know Bookbub? You must know Bookbub.com, which is the ebook um, promotion site. Chirp, okay. They also own Chirp Books, and that is a okay. audio promotion site. So, for example, I'm I've got a deal um, coming up next month where I'll drop my and uh, I'll drop the first in series. This is for fiction. I'll drop it to ninety nine cents for the audio book, and in fact, I'll drop my whole series that write down and they promote it and it goes out to their email list it's one of those sites but for audio now you right. you could you can only do that if you publish through find a way voices not right. just audible oops sorry there <laughs> forgot to disconnect my phone <laughs> so um there was a question that i wanted to ask you but it's gone It'll the come way back. of the the dodo bird. <laughs> so, uh, okay, let's see what else. Uh, I think I'd like to then now move on to uh, to podcasting because I'm doing a course on podcasting. So I want to really have people understand that hmm. it was one of the things that I really got interested in. And it was just, sorry, there was just one more thing I wanted to add on um, okay. audio uh, because you, you'd written this down and I wrote it down, which is um, in terms of promoting all the additions to your books, I recommend people use a site called books to read.com. So books, yeah. the number two read.com. And you can add in links to your ebook, your paperback, hardback, large print and audiobook links. So it's one link and it's all free, uh, one link, and then people click on it and they can choose their formats so, because one of the key things with all this marketing is you've got to give people the choice of where to buy so this is this books to read.com enables enables you to use one link on your social media or email or business card whatever and that then people have a choice and that includes audiobooks so i just wanted to mention that okay that's great um so is it easy to start a podcast <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I love this question because on the one hand you could say yeah of course you just go onto a site like anchor or like there's hundreds of them now you just press a button that says start podcast and you have a podcast and da-da. but of course that it's the same to publish a kindle book almost you know you just upload a word document and use a free cover and there you go but in exactly the same way that is not the answer <laughs> <laughs> so so I think that the main thing is, yes, it's easy to technically start a podcast, yeah. but what you actually need to do is think before <sighs> you start one. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm just having I get distracted by the phone and the oh. answering machine and so I apologize for that. <laughs> That's all right. So I'll, I'll carry on. So yes, so spend some time thinking first. So what niche are you going into? And not just that, what angle in that niche are you going into? So my podcast, right. The Creative Pen, is in, in the publishing and the creator niche, but it's particularly for independent independently minded authors um then who are the target audience uh what is your monetization strategy because look you can start a podcast but if it's still going three years later and you haven't made any money in some form you're you will probably give it up because costs do appear um what is your content strategy so what type of show are you going to do um how are you going to brand it what's your imaging going to be what is the name going to be because this is a huge deal because of seo and that type of thing and also are you ready to commit for the long term and are you ready to put yourself out there in the world in this way because sure no one might find you you might be speaking to nothing or <laughs> you might suddenly have an audience or over the years build an audience and then you're responsible for the words that you say in the world in public so are you ready for that kind of exposure um and what what is your angle uh, is is the main thing so if you can answer all those questions then yes it's easy to start a podcast <laughs> I think I read somewhere that like 80% of the podcasts on Apple iTunes are no longer active. It, yes. It's some, it's some big number uh, that a lot of people, they started up, they, you know, they go, wow, this is fun. They do three episodes and they quit. And they quit. Well, and this is why I actually have a rule. Um, I, I get pitched to go on podcasts all the time. And I say, um, please only pitch me when you have 30 shows. Uh, live because right. if, if someone gets to 30 live shows then usually they're gonna at least stick around for a bit but um <laughs> you know I'm on what episode 600 of my podcast um and I know that it takes time to build an audience but equally I think it's like in the you know when everyone had a blog you yeah, I started like four different blogs and I was like ah actually that's not the right angle so I think it's completely natural to let things go but right. um, if you want a successful podcast, then you have to think about these things. The other thing is um, I want to encourage people because one of the problems is that so many podcasts are by certain people. So, for example, um, in the tech niche, there's a lot of young, well, not young, uh, middle aged men in their late 30s, early 40s, like tech bros, you know, Americans. But there might not be so many Mexican female tech entrepreneur podcasters. So this is, I think this is the way to think. I mean, like me as a British woman in the publishing space, I'm at, you know, there, there are now more women, but when I started, there were very few women podcasting in general. So look, when you're looking at your niche, have a look at the other podcasts and kind of see, well, I like what they're doing, but I'm different in this way. And I like what they're doing, but I'm different in this way and find where you fit. Otherwise, like you say, you'll be like, okay, well, that's a bit tough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you do have to figure out a way to stand out. Mm. <clears throat> uh, one of the quandaries I have sometimes is, you know, helping uh, think about it, uh, what kind of podcast an author should do. Now, I think in fiction, sometimes you could just do one where you read parts of your book. Uh, so yeah, like I wouldn't bother Andy, with that. Andy Weir did with The Martian, and he did it very successfully. Yeah, but, but he's, uh, he's an outlier. For, yeah. yeah, for a lot of people, I think they people like to listen to interviews. Uh, I found that to be the case. But at the same time, there are things I'd like to do with my podcast where I've just talked myself. 
Hmm. And but then are you sending two different messages if you're using different formats? I think your podcast is uh, all interviews. Uh, no, I do. Um, well, I do a couple of things. So one is I always do an introductory segment, which is usually about 20 minutes, um, which a lot of my listeners just come for the introductory <laughs> segment, which is uh, what's happening, like what's happening in the news and then in the publishing and book marketing news. And then what's, right. how's my author career going? Because I stay accountable to my audience and um, any and then interactions with my patrons and with comments and tweets and things like that. So there's always an introductory segment and then I also do solo shows so for example my episode 600 um, which is next weekend as I um, as we're recording this um, that will be a solo show and I'm just going to answer questions from the community and then I'll do um, solo stuff in between but um, you're right most of my episodes the main content is an interview and the, the, one of the reasons is because it's much much easier like you and I are creating an hour's probably worth of content and we've both done some preparation but essentially it's much quicker for us both to have a conversation right. that if you were trying to prepare this yourself you would have to do a lot more work <laughs> <laughs> so basically it's a really and also there's networking you and I you know you came on my podcast and that's coming out soon and I'm coming on yours we're having a networking chat we're renewing a relationship um, and right. you know that kind of thing so I would also caution, I was thinking about that, I would caution people on doing co-hosting because every co-hosted, I was trying to think like pretty much every co-hosted podcast I've been across in the last 13 years of podcasting, they're all gone because the relationships between the co-hosts change <laughs> as relationships do. And then who owns the podcast then? Um, and often right. those people go on and start another podcast somewhere else or whatever, and they stay in the community, but that show has disappeared. And then, you know, the feed has stopped and, and also the intellectual property. We are creating a piece of intellectual property together. Um, it just becomes difficult. Then who owns the email list that we, the call to action, who owns their website? Um, so that would be one caution is it can seem easier to just have a co-host, but <sighs> In my experience, if you want to do it long term, then doing something yourself is probably better or at least getting clear on who owns it. Yeah, I'm surprised by uh, some of the authors who are co-authors of a fiction uh, series, uh, Preston and Child, I think of. And I think, you know, wow, uh, you know, marriages don't last that long. You know, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> They do keep so, getting big book contracts, though. I like their books. I like the Pendergast series. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a challenge to keep, you know, something like that going uh, over time. I know that both of the authors do their own books as well. So, you know, it probably works well. It's probably fun in some ways to co-author a book or do a, a podcast together. But I found that a lot of times... And when you have two people on a podcast, they just talk to each other. Mm. And it's sort of like, well, where's the content? <laughs> you know? Yes. And some people want that banter. Like, you know, there is the, ban the banter type of podcast, if that's right. your thing. But look, you and I are both real content producers. And probably the people listening to this are more people who are more like us and want to produce content i mean your audience produce content so right. to, to me it is exactly right it's about here's the questions and i do like this too i prepare questions um i know what i want to ask and i uh, you know this might be a bit of banter but it's mostly about the content that will serve the audience uh right. of the podcaster and that's a really important point yes um so i was thinking about that i was wondering if you know like my tell me a story podcast is one to five minutes mm. so it's real short so far i haven't really monetized it but i i like doing it because i love sh sharing my wife's stories and some of the other stories that i find and so on but probably the most effective kind of podcast is something that you do at least once a week mm. and you do it for at least half hour to an hour I would presume that that's uh, the kind that builds up an audience. 
Yes, you need enough time. I mean, there have been some very successful podcasts of John Lee Dumas with um, Entrepreneur on Fire, one of the, mo- the most uh, successful podcasters in terms of money. But if, I mean, I don't listen to that show because it's the same questions for every single person. I've been on that show, but it's like, if you ask the same questions of every person, then I don't, I mean, I like the chat. I like finding out about the person I'm interviewing and I will ask questions that are specific for that person. Um, So yeah, I think you you in terms of length it's quite interesting because I mean Tim Ferriss has a huge podcast some of his interviews are like three hours long Joe Rogan (laughs) obviously also three hours long personally I like to keep things around an hour and but and my introductions like 20 minutes um but yeah the length you're right you have to have engagement and one of the other things is that people connect with the host of the podcast because they're the voice they hear most so I would always advise to inject your own personality and your own life into the show because that's the way you're going to stand out is by being you and connecting with people um but just come back on your story podcast so there's an example similar to writing books sometimes you just write a book or do a podcast because it's creative and fun it doesn't have to have anything you could just stop that tomorrow it's not going to affect your business it's just fun right whereas um my and i have have the books and travel podcast which is kind of like that it's like I just love talking to people about travel but my creative pen <laughs> podcast uh, has grown from a hobby into a huge part of my business I get paid you know advertising fees I have a patreon um, I obviously market my books I use affiliate links um, I do you know I advertise webinars and things like that so Uh, But that monetization strategy emerged over time. So again, you could in the future decide to monetize your story thing, maybe with fiction or, you know, actually sell those books as I'm planning to do with my books and travel podcast. So you don't have to do it right from the beginning. But I do think that at some point you have to have a reason to carry on podcasting. And if you if it's not fun and or and or you're not making any money and or you're not marketing any product or book or service or whatever, then you'll probably stop. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's just fun and you like it. Yeah, if it's fun, then that's but it has to fulfill something in your life. Like like any form of marketing, if it's gr- the grind, if you're like, oh, my goodness, I just don't want to do this. Voice is incredibly revealing. People will know you have to come to the microphone with emotion. It is a performance. You know, I I'm an introvert. I, I don't talk that much. But when <laughs> I come on a podcast, you know, I put my makeup on. I've done my hair. I'm I'm doing my Joanna Penn podcasting thing. I'm bringing the energy um, to you and your listeners because this is the way to communicate meaning and feeling uh so yeah if you hate it people are going to realize and people just won't listen (laughs) yes and uh with tell me a story it it only takes me like five minutes to to do an episode uh because i'm basically just typing in the story and then reading it hopefully with enough passion or something to make it interesting but so it's not that complicated something like this, you know, uh, you have to figure out, okay, what do I want to learn from the guest? Mm. So then you invent, you know, the questions based on that. And so you, you have to, you know, you have to do a little bit of pre-work. Exactly. But that's what makes it worthwhile, both to you and me, uh, because we learn something. I mean, I only interview people who I'm actually interested in. (laughs) Like I'll never just, (laughs) I'll never just, in fact, I, I will say no to pictures from like people who are just they might be famous or they're really important in some way but they have nothing to teach my audience you know I'm far more likely to take a pitch from someone who's maybe got one book but it's on a topic that I think is just brilliant so you know we're serving our audience as as podcasters and we do that by giving a good interview and bringing good guests and and then editing necessarily sometimes to get rid of stuff that is just extraneous and I was going to mention this there's a really great tool called descript.com descript.com and it you can uh, it's just amazing I mean uh, this saves so much time you can put in an audio file and it generates a transcript and then you can edit with the words so we could see um you know 
whatever the filler words are and you can remove those and that cuts some time but also you know I had someone on for one topic and they went off about a something I was not going to put on my show um <laughs> so I just cut that bit out <laughs> completely I was like nope not happening or sometimes like I have a clean show and sometimes someone will swear and I'll obviously have to edit that but I can do it all with with words as opposed to the waveform the audio editing so I really love that that's descript.com okay that's great that's great advice uh it's nice that you've mentioned a number of different tools and I think Find a, a Way Voices is going to be really big now mm. that Substack owns it. Spotify. Uh, what, Spotify. What? Spotify. Oh, Spotify. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're right. There we go. Uh, Spotify. Because Spotify is really wanting to get into audio much more uh, audio, uh, spoken word. Mm. And so they're, they're getting big into podcasting, but they're also starting to uh, create their own exclusive uh, audiobooks. Yeah, they are the rival to Audible. And I mean, I switched all a few, like 18 months ago, or whatever, I switched pretty much all my audio over to um, Spotify. And once they get audiobooks, I will probably move my subscription over like completely. I mean, I'm already a subscriber. So I think, and I get all my podcasts on Spotify and I use it like a search engine. So if I want to know a topic, I'll type the topic into the podcasting search engine and it will come up with episodes and I'll just dip in and out of different shows. Like I only, right. I'm like a, I only listen to some shows every week, but mostly I'm dipping in and out on topics that I'm interested in. So people's behavior has changed with audio uh, over time, but yeah, Spotify has the killer algorithm rhythm like killer discoverability so um yeah i know and i know some people think oh but you know they pay a little bit of money well so do a lot of places our job um with uh with all our work our job is to be where people are and bring them back to our hub which is our website our email list and right. sell uh hopefully they will pay more money for other products over time so i see being on spotify as an audio creator to be absolutely critical <laughs> but find a way voices also syndicates to audible right yes you can publish through find a way yeah to audible apple books google books kobo everywhere pretty much um and i mean at the moment as we record this there are uh they don't uh send to spotify but how i mean how lo much longer will it take they bought them in i think november or december 2021 so only a few months ago as we as we speak right. so by by the end of 2022 i would expect to see um it happening they're making a lot of money through the ads that they run uh against the podcast and so on so I know that they, that's one of the reasons they want to get more into the spoken word audio. But they're also, I'm a subscriber and I don't hear any ads. I pay per month and I don't get ads. So they make money from subscription from people right. like me and then ads from people who don't pay. Well, they get almost a trillion dollars in ads now Yeah, uh, I mean, from, from podcasting and so on. So it, it's significant enough that they they're really expanding into it oh absolutely which, which mm. i think is great and then of course they have their subscribers just like audible does mm. um and you know we my wife and i belong to audible and we listen a lot they're both their freebies which i presume they pay their authors somehow on the freebies but then you know we also you know get the credits that we mm. buy books for but then it's still hard to find some books there's one that my wife wants right now called Teata, I think it is. It's about a, a Indian storyteller, um, American Indian. And she just wants a, it's apparently a Netflix movie. Oh, and right. she, but movies are even hard for her to consume because of her eyes right now. Mm -hmm. So she's looking for an audible audio version of it. And that we, we don't find one yet. Mm. So yeah. You know, th those things still happen. I mean, Audible certainly doesn't have every book and, and well, Spotify. Well, most books, yeah. Most books are not in audio. Right. So yeah. that's why it's still a growth market. Absolutely. Yeah. And Spotify's the uh, same way. I think they probably cover almost all music. 
um, but they probably have some people that are holding out their music from them. I'm sure. Yeah, and just like some people holding back from Apple, but then there's still the whole audiobook thing, and I really think that it's a uh, the audiobook and podcasting. I think it's a real still. I think a, a good territory for authors to get into, and that's oh, why I wanted absolutely. to speak to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm. Yeah. What does an author, how does an author find the best podcast to pitch as a guest? Well, the main thing, I mean, you can just go on Google and say best book marketing podcast and see what comes <laughs> up and then listen to them. But essentially, uh, you need to obviously you need to know your niche and then go looking, um, whether that's on Spotify or Apple or Google podcasts or just Google. There'll be loads of lists for that kind of thing. Uh, and then you need to listen to some uh, because the worst pitches are the ones where clearly they haven't listened to the show and they're <laughs> like, hey, I've, I I want want to talk about credit cards on your podcast it's like what don't be ridiculous delete um you know so you have to you have to find a sort of a list find a long list maybe like 20 that you and, and they don't just have to be about your niche of your book they can also be other things that you're interested in for example um you know i'm a female entrepreneur or a female in tech um, I could go on a female tech podcast. I could also go on a fiction writing podcast. I could also, I've been on a Jungian psychology podcast because that was <laughs> a topic that I, in my first novel, um, you know, I go on uh, cre different creator podcasts. So you, you can pitch for your personality or maybe you you feature dogs in your book or something then you you could try a dog so think in these different segments um of of your life and the book and what the book books are and then have a listen and then do you resonate with that show so for example in america you have some interesting political um sides of the spectrum is it, are you going to really hate talking to this um, this show host, <laughs> for example? Like you have to find some common ground. So what I'll do is, okay, I can see, um, oh, look, John Kramer has a book on marketing. So I will make, uh, we have something in common. So that could be something I bring up. So I will make sort of notes um, on people that I think, yeah, yeah, I would talk to them. Um, and then, yeah, you need to then, so you need to know the podcast, you need to have a look at the host, and then you need to think about the audience. Is this audience a good fit for you? So for example, I've gone on shows where they ask, have asked me, I've thought it was a good fit, but then they've asked me things like, how do you get an agent? And I'm like, well, I don't have an agent. Um, and that's not what I do. <laughs> I'm an independent creator. Uh, and I license my own work. And they're like, oh, okay then uh you know so, so that there hasn't been a good fit even if you think it's the right niche and then it's not so that's what you have to do in is to to pitch because and it's much better to only pitch five podcasts that match really well you're far more likely to get a good hit rate than i know there's all these pitching companies now like you pay a pitching company and they'll be like yeah we'll pitch a hundred podcasts for you I um, mean, we know it's like doing a press release. It's like spam, spam, spam. Um, whereas individual targeting, and I would much rather hear from the author directly than some PR person, uh, you know, pitch me with a good idea that my audience want and demonstrate that you've actually paid some attention to what I do and what my audience want. And I am far more likely to say yes. So uh, yeah, I think that, that covers it. <laughs> I think it does. But, you know, there's also the aspect of how to be a good guest once you do find one. Mm. And one of the things I think makes for a good guest is somebody that actually promotes the podcast that featured them. Oh, see, I don't think that at all. You don't? I, no, it's not even on my list. Uh, the most important thing to me is, see, it's my job to look after my audience so if you come on my show which you have then i expect you to give good information or information right. inspiration i all i expect of my guest is to give everything and that's what my biggest tip is do not hold back like give as much right. as you give as much value as you can in the amount of time, give away everything, answer all the questions um, in a way that helps the audience. And if you do that, you're a brilliant guest. Everything else will be forgiven. Like, yes, it would be ideal if you had some good sound equipment, but it's much better to give uh, a good interview um, 
in that way that I've talked about, like, so you see who are the, who is the audience? So I know, I mean, we know each other, you know, so I know my, the audience here, but if I was going on a new podcast, I'd be like, okay, so who, who is the target market? What examples can I use? Oh, I was on a show earlier um, where their tagline was like freedom and liberty. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's cool. I'm an independent creator. So I emphasized the freedom aspect more than perhaps I would on other shows and went with that angle um into and that will hopefully will provide value to that audience so yes do your research um also conversation <laughs> i mean i obviously have prepared some notes here but i'm not reading from my notes i'm right. i've got my notes to remind me of things i want to say that are useful but i'm also you and i are interacting uh, it's going back and forwards if i feel like I've said too much, I'll stop and let you have a go. But the, what, like the worst interview I ever had was a monosyllabic author. You know, I'd be like asking a question and he would go, yes. <laughs> and I was like, this is so much hard work. Like having <laughs> to have to like pull something out of someone, uh, you know, make it easy on the host. Um, yeah, so that's my angle. The promoting it. I'm I'm less worried about that at all. Like really, I see that as my job, and I look after my audience. If they send people over, all well and good, but I look after mine, my audience. I just think it's a courtesy to uh, promote the podcast you're on. I, I better always promote try. this one then, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely, uh, but. Uh, you know, for me, I think uh, it's sort of like a courtesy thing to do it. Uh, I understand that there are some people you want them on because of the content they offer, not because they're going to promote you. Yeah, they might and, not even have an audience, but they might have something really <laughs> valuable to say. <laughs> Excuse me. And and that's, you know, a real key part of it, because what you want best is a good podcast episode. Mm. You want good content. You want something that people will share. And that's more important than anything else. I agree yeah. with you on that. Yeah. I also want it, SEO content. So I specifically look for content where I know that SEO, search engine optimization, will be good. So um, I and I see this as a long tail process. So sure, someone might send out a tweet or an email after they've been on my show, but I get traffic on episodes like for over a decade uh, right, since I started right. podcasting. So it's more important to me. So I know, for example, that a show on editing editing fiction in particular will do really well so I make sure that okay you know I put in fiction editors uh for you know to make sure that topic is coming up because I know um and I don't expect them to promote it at all I'm doing it for my business right. and my audience so I I get what you mean but I would never expect that I get I get what you mean as well because <laughs> for example if I were to interview a bookstore uh owner I know they're not going to promote it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but I'm hoping to get some good content out of them mm. that will be useful for the authors and so on. Or the same with editors. Uh, you wouldn't expect them to promote. Mm. But if I'm talking to an internet marketer, I'm hoping they'll promote. Yeah, hoping is fine. But you know, some, <laughs> I've, I've had some people like, oh, can you come on my podcast? But by the way, if you come on my podcast, you have to promote three times to your email list. And, yeah. and I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Delete. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I get that side of it, too. So uh, let's see. I'd like to talk, you know, I'm, I know we're coming towards the end. I'd like to ask a little bit. Of, I know that you're enthusiastic about uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. speech to text, text to speech, uh, that whole gamut of possibilities. And one thing I've noticed over the last five, 10 years is that um, text to speech is getting much better. You can actually enter a text and it actually sounds like a real person is, is repeating it. And that's partially, I think, uh, an algorithm and artificial intelligence. It's not just that the, you know, the, however they process the speech otherwise, mm. uh, they do something that is a lot better. It sounds like almost like a real person, almost. 
Yeah, well, well, that, and there becomes a question because it can sound exactly like a real person, but do we want it to? So this is actually an ethical question that's coming up about labeling of what is AI and what is not AI. But you're right, um, the AI voice um, uh, space has just dramatically accelerated. Google has AI narrated audiobooks on the Google Play Store already. Um, there yeah. are companies like uh, Deep Zen, who I've used to do two um, AI narrated audiobooks, a fiction and a nonfiction, um, Speech Key, Scribe Audio, even Amazon Polly, which is Amazon's own um, voice that you can use to do things. Mm. Uh, and then Descript, which I mentioned earlier, you can create a voice double. So I've done a few shows with my voice double, which is It Sounds Like Me. And I can put it in the podcast. And uh, I always say, this is not me. This is my voice double. You know, I always admit when I'm using AI. But the point is that um, if you uh, if you listen to some of these, um, and I can spell these companies for you later, so you can put it in the notes or whatever, but um, the cost is a lot lower to do audio. I want choice of voice. So, for example, my uh, A Thousand Fiendish Angels, which is uh, three short stories, I've recorded it in a British female voice. And then I got a male American AI to read it. And it sounds obviously completely different because I'm not an American man. And oh, I might have been a British man, but it was a man anyway. So it was completely <laughs> different. And so what I want as a listener, okay, I don't want to always have the same narrator. So I listen to a lot of business books and they're pretty much always narrated by an American man, regardless who wrote it. Um, so it's like, well, what if I want to listen to that in a British female voice? I should be able to just choose a different book. And that's only possible with with AI, bring down the cost. And then, of course, we talk about, well, what about accent? It's all very well having British English, American English, but what about, um, you know, Indian English or Nigerian English or um, Jamaican English? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to choose your accent? And then, of course, it's all the different languages around the world. Why can't we just easily have our books available in different languages and different, um, you know, sp speech patterns. Uh, so this is what will be enabled with AI audio. And people are quite upset about it in many ways. We talked about narrators earlier, but narrators will be able to license their voices. So I'm working on hopefully this year, I'll be able to get my voice up as an AI voice that if you use my voice to narrate your book, I get paid a license fee for you doing that okay or, or you could use someone famous like Stephen Fry or whatever um and then so that's one thing um and also for narrators I don't see it as an either or I see it as a cheap option AI a premium option a human narrator and a really premium option which is the full cast audio drama sound effects orchestra so you've got stratification of audio rights rather than just here's the exact audio book for right. this book. Like it, it's expanding the industry, not shrinking it. And that's why I'm so positive about it. But yeah, it's things are moving super, like much faster than I thought. So, and with Sp Spotify allows AI generated music. So it may be that Spotify will allow AI narrated audiobooks. We don't know yet, but at the moment you have to sell it direct because you can't distribute it otherwise. But um, yeah, I, I find it fascinating. I think it might be interesting if I redid this, uh, this particular podcast with a Jamaican man voice. Yeah, it'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely. But it, what it does mean, so for example, with your thousand and one um, ways to market a book, uh, that is that would be so much cheaper to do with an AI voice. And also it, the production is so easy. And what's amazing is if something's pronounced wrong, you just retype it and it redoes that regenerates the whole thing which is brilliant with fiction like if someone's pronounced a name wrong like all the way through or whatever it's really easy to fix so I think we're going to see a lot more of this and a lot more tools um in the same way like we have vellum for formatting um books we'll, we'll get tools where we can format with AI voices and and then you just get some you'll get some amazingly creative things where different AI voices will work together and I you could do a full cast AI audio <laughs> I just think there's so much potential ahead so I, I hope people are excited about that have you created any uh Spanish version versions of your uh fiction books let's say 
I have done um, some Spanish. I've done German. Um, uh, but the problem... Not through AI? No. Uh, with AI translation for nonfiction, AI translation is obviously a completely different discussion. But um, okay. <laughs> I, have, uh, I haven't done any audiobooks in translation with AI, um, because mainly because it's very hard to to judge quality and at the moment I can only judge things in English um, anyway so right but it's definitely something I would love to see more of I think it could be interesting uh, to see uh, especially with uh, self-publishers and so on mm. uh, doing the Spanish audio because they may not have a opportunity to be visible enough to, for you know some company in Spain to come and say we'd like to do the audio of your book and publish yeah, the print version. Absolutely. Yeah. There is so much potential. I mean, we're both enthusiastic about the industry, but I feel yes. like with audio, we're we're like like Jeff Basil says, it's day one. Like it's day one for <laughs> audio. You have not missed it, listeners. Like if you if you're thinking, oh maybe I'm too late. No, you are not too late. It is barely beginning. Like really, this is all very exciting. It's interesting because podcasting has been around for 15, 20 years at least, mm. I would think. But it's really starting to take off on another level, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, I'm asking people and telling people you need to do a podcast. It's one of the most effective ways to get you, you and your books out there into the marketplace. Well, because say, people will pay attention to audio in a different way than reading something. I do think it's a commitment. So what I would say is either start your own podcast or pitch, put on your list. I must pitch, let's say six podcasts a year. I must make sure that in a year I am available in audio it, when I'm talking about my book. And if you need right. like, voice, voice training or interview training, then sort that out. But this form of marketing, as you said, is, is not going away. Um, and it's obviously not as much work to be a guest on a show than it is to produce your own show. So yeah, lots of lots of ideas there. Okay. Any last uh, advice you'd like to leave with authors? Or certainly, uh, I'd be happy if you pitch something. No, oh, well, if you're interested in my book, Audio for Authors, then it is available in audiobook <laughs> as well as ebook and print and all the rest. Um, but yes, you can also come over to the Creative Pen Podcast, Pen with a Double N, and that's uh, every Monday. <laughs> okay, I'm anxious to hear mine. <laughs> it, it's coming, John. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, so, anything else? Uh, any little piece of advice or? Uh, um, just give it a go that's my advice give it a go my first go. interview was on a phone holding a recording device next to the phone <laughs> like back in the day when it was like put it on speakerphone like literally that was my episode one I didn't have a clue what I was doing but oh, hey, wow you know you got to start somewhere <laughs> I gotta go back and listen to that one I presume <laughs> it's still up there somewhere it's still there, thecreativepen.com <laughs> forward slash podcast, like scroll to the bottom and there it is. Scroll, scroll, <laughs> scroll, scroll through 600 episodes and finally you get the gem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I keep I keep these things up for posterity, right? And my old YouTube videos from 2009. And I mean, right. you know, we all know how this goes. Things take time to build. But yeah, just try, just try. That's all we can do and uh, put stuff out there. And it's amazing what might happen. I think a lot of it has to do with just really liking your audience. Mm. I think that comes through in a good podcast and or in an interview with somebody's interviewing you for a podcast. That kind of enthusiasm is real important. That mm. kind of love for your audience, I think, is important. Indeed. Well, thank you for having me, John. Yes, thank you very much. So everybody go to the, the Creative Pen podcast.com no just, just thecreativepen.com or just okay. search for the creative pen with a double n on your podcast app double n you gotta get that <laughs> thank you very much thanks john <laughs>